Hello, my name is Shankar. I'm a pediatric electrophysiologist at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, an assistant professor of pediatrics at University of Cincinnati, Ohio, United States. I'd like to thank the organizers of Pedurism for the opportunity to talk on this interesting topic of catheter ablation of difficult pathway locations. My only disclosure is that I'm an early career faculty and I finished my EP fellowship at Boston Children's in 2019. Learned pretty quickly that there are no easy locations, just that some ablation are easier. In the interest of time, I'll focus on those areas that I anticipate certain foreseeable difficulties. So what makes a pathway difficult? To be close to the AV node his bundle, risk of coronary artery injury, difficulty with accessing the pathway, and difficulty with stability. And how do we mitigate these difficulties? Preparations, such as having good algorithmic prediction of pathway location, having a different axis when needed, good anatomical understanding of the area. Electrophysiologic maneuvers can help in a sting in appropriate ablation. What is EP without its tools and how can you use it to augment success? This is a nine year old with palpitations, who had the most success with the Aruda algorithm. As you all know, there are multiple algorithms to choose from. The more recent one that I've come across is the WPW24.com by Professor Marek Jaskrzewski from Poland based on about 1,000 patients. And for this patient, higher likelihood of being right inferoceptal. And this patient ended up having a left post receptor um, location. So going into the anatomy of the post receptor location, during my training within EP anatomy, I've learned anatomy by holding heart specimens, using fluoroscopy, but using cross-sectional imaging can give a very clear understanding as shown by this group, um, which has published a series of articles in Europe base. Looking at this location, it's actually an inferior location rather than a posterior location. And both the right AV groove and the left AV groove is separated by this region where there's fat. And the septum is actually far from both these grooves, making these regions, which we call as right postroceptal and left postroceptal, actually being right inferior paraseptal region, left inferior paraseptal region, and the mid inferior paraseptal region. This presence on fat in the inferior AV groove makes accessing these areas from the right side very difficult, and we would, one would have to go to the left side as we all very well know. So what are the potential difficulties? Coronary artery injury, right versus left, and when to go to the left for ablation, differentiating AV nodal versus AP conduction. The risk of coronary artery injury is highest in the post receptor location as shown by this good systematic review. The postrolateral coronary artery travels very close to the coronary sinus os and coronary sinus and ablation in this location can be associated with coronary artery injury. This elegant study by the German group um, showed that in, among patients having, pediatric patients having SVT ablations, doing coronary angiograms before and after an EP study showed that about two patients had coronary artery stenosis, both in the postroceptal location. Fortunately, they both recovered without any treatment and this was only very transient. Um, as shown by Dr. Jackman's group, coronary artery injury can be prevented by doing a coronary artery angiogram and not using RF if it's close to five millimeters, the coronary artery. We ourselves have done a multi-center study um, within the United States, but in a few centers, and we showed in about 70 patients having RF ablation done within the coronary sinus, only about 4% actually had a coronary angiogram done. So given this risk, I've often tried to go to the left um, when possible. There are some algorithms that can be helpful in distinguishing between right versus left 
based on the pre-excitation. I often use um, having a positive delta wave in V1 to indicate that to go to the left. But this particular algorithm by Ascale, published in Europe base, shows that a typical left-sided axillary pathway has a typical transition where there is um, of the QRS with a negative overall QRS in V1, which becomes positive V2, V3. Whereas a right-sided has a double transition, meaning that having a negative Q wave in V1, which becomes positive in V2, and then negative again in V3. What about those who have inducible SVT? This elegant article by Kanavati et al. uses a difference in the VA interval during orthodromic uh, reciprocating tachycardia versus during RV pacing to determine when to approach from the left. This is based on the distance the pacing impulse has to travel from the RV apex where you're pacing to a left sided axillary pathway. A delta VA of greater than 40 milliseconds can be used to approach from the left. Here I show an example from our lab where the delta wave does not change significantly with V entrainment of 146 milliseconds to off V entrainment 133 milliseconds and had a successful operation on the right side. During mapping, trying to distinguish axillary pathway versus AV nodal conduction is of paramount importance. One main factor is to pace not from the RV apex when you're trying to map axillary pathways in this location, but rather pace close to the base. The other important maneuver that we use is parahysian pacing maneuver, which we all well aware of um, as demonstrated by Dr. Jackman's group. These can have limitations. This is a good article um, to remind you of the limitations and the interpretations. An important uh, finding is that the VA interval is not the only thing that we'd have to pay attention, but also the atrial activation sequence. In, in septal axillary pathway versus an AV nodal uh, conduction can have subtle change in the atrial activation sequence as shown in this patient who the, you know, who you, you had to look without thinking of the atrial activation sequence, would say that this is an AV nodal response. Yes, it is an AV nodal response, but during local myocardial capture, there is a, there is a different atrial activation sequence signifying the presence of an axillary pathway. Routinely using pre-excitation index, um, as which has been like um, published a long time ago in differentiating AV and RT from ORT and using um, entrainment to see the PPI minus tachycardia cycle length can be extremely helpful in distinguishing ORT from AV and RT, um, and ORT using a septal axillary pathway. We very frequently use this cutoff of PPI minus tachycardia cycle length of 115 milliseconds for uh, separating those. I've oftentimes had difficulty with tachycardia termination on entrainment and this very elegant article by Al Mahmid Tal, who belongs to the same group of Mishad, um, showed in this study, and they used this concept of fusion um, when starting RV entrainment. In case of ORT, the fusion affects the AA interval or the atrial cycle length during the time of fusion, whereas in AVNRT, the fusion has to um, be complete before the atrial cycle length is affected. As you can see in this picture, in this patient first with ORT, um, you have a stable ORT. And when you start entrainment, you have fusion with the paced stable morphology. The AA interval changes during the fusion time, whereas when you compare it to AB and RT, the AA interval remains um, unchanged during the fusion, but changes only at the time of a paced stable morphology. This can be helpful in distinguishing ORT from AV and RT. And coming on to mapping, this is a classic paper by Dr. Jackman's group showing the slant of the pathway, which is present in greater than 80% of patients. And we have found it very helpful in um, finding a good area for 
ablation. Dr. Jackman's group um, often talks about like, finding the axillary pathway potential when mapping um, using this technique. We've also just had like better success when using this technique. And the main concept here is that facing on the side of the slant can result in you mapping the earliest activation away from the actual site of the axillary pathway and can be improved by pacing against the slant, which will um, ensure that your earlier timing happens at the, um, at the site of your um, actual pathway. And this is the typical slant which are available. And as you can see in the postreceptor location when pacing the V and mapping the earliest V, while pacing the A, it is best done by um, pacing in the right atrial appendage because that will allow a good separation of the AV interval. Whereas if you were to pace from the um, mid CS, it'll result in fusion of the AV complexes as shown in the previous diagram. The other um, um, maneuver that we use in the lab is they call us the paste S2 protocol, which is present in microphase, which allows you to bring in the V while you are pacing the S, while you are pacing the atrium, or vice versa, and this allows you to say, well, what is A and what is V. The other mapping technique that we use is using the unipolar signals which even if by using IVC electrode, I've not been very successful in finding um, good axillary pathway potentials, nevertheless found it very helpful in finding an atrial fiduciary as shown in this paper for mapping atrial tachycardia focus by changing the high pass filter to 30 um, millihertz, you one can see a good atrial signal on the uh, unipolar electrode. And when mapping, um, axillary pathway and trying to determine where the V ends from where the A starts, one can very clearly see an A signal on the unipolar um, when appropriate um, high pass filter has been placed. Now we have a 17 year old with pre-excitation syncope, positive in two, three AVF, negative in E1, which takes you to your anterior superior parhesian septal axillary pathway with potential difficulties of conduction system injury and recurrence risk. Again, going back to the anatomy, both the antraceptal and the parahisian location are two different terms, but in general, actually mean the same as shown here in this picture by Shampi Mori et al, um, where they show the triangle of Koch and the, the green, they show the membranous septum, which signifies the area, the bundle of his uh, penetrates. One important structure is the supraventricular crust, uh, crust which, um, which is right here, very close to the membrane septum. And within axillary pathways in this location, two separate axillary pathways, which I've often realized that during EP studies, but it is good to see it from an anatomical sense. One type is where the axillary pathways arise in this location, goes across the membrane septum, and inserts on top of the interventricular septum. Whereas in another type, the axillary pathways actually insert into the supraventricular crest. And when I say supraventricular crest, if you see this LAO view here, oftentimes when we have blade axillary pathways here, sometimes cheat to the right, and they're often successful in this uh, crustal axillary pathways, whereas those that cause the membrane septum and attach onto the interventricular septum can be or usually successful when approaching from the non-coronary sinus of the iota. Again, the slant of the axillary pathway is, uh, shows that the pathway is slanted um, towards, the, towards the right. We oftentimes cheat to the right when trying to target these axillary pathways. Again, in order to map this with when pre-excited, Facing from the right atrial appendage will give you the maximal separation, but being careful that you're able to monitor AV nodal conduction. And in the pediatric experience with antraceptal axillary pathways, um, there are different approaches, both inferior by the superior approach by clock, clocking under the valve and by the aortic approach. Um, and they 
this is a Boston experience or a Boston children's experience. They showed that there is a pretty, you know, like, um, although that can be good amount of success, the, uh, the failure rate among using the inferior approach is high. And hence, you know, like we routinely place a right IJ and are ready to get retrograde access among these patients. Recurrence risk is not uncommon in this group. And again, it can be mitigated by trying to approach this from different um, um, access points. Here you see a paraantraceptal or parahysian pathway getting approached by IVC approach and having successful ablation using cryocatheter. Here in this patient, somebody who we have tried all of those here, you see red dots which signify RF lesions from the neck and cryo lesions again without any success. And then we used ice to map out the um, sciotic sinuses and having ultimate success from non-coronary sinus. And now among um, ablation within the coronary sun on coronary cusp or the uh, right coronary cusp. This is one of the larger uh, pediatric series. Again, there aren't a huge numbers, but they are. They can be safe and with the recurrence risk being low. You can still injure the conduction system, so one has to be very careful when dealing with them. And one would have to shoot coronaries to make sure that you're not up to five millimeters close to the um, coronaries. Fortunately for the axillary pathways, most of them are approached from the non-coronary cusp. So 16 year old with palpitations, again, you know, it seems to take you to the anteroceptal location, but ultimately turned out to be a midceptal location. The same group again, is classified this area as being superior, middle and inferior. We use the roof of the coronary sinus to say, you know, like that's when you go into the mid-septal territory and being very careful of the AV nodal location. And AV nodal injury and recurrence risks are the highest here. And in our group, we use cryocatheter to approach this area, either from the IVC or from the neck. Again, the same Boston children's experience showing um, higher success rate from the inferior approach. And um, again, recurrence risk remains an issue in this location. Right free wall axillary pathways can have problems with catheter stability and recurrence risks. Um, we can use sheets, long sheets, to help with stability in this location. And especially, you know, like the Visigo sheet has been very helpful to get like a very good understanding. And here, one of my partners and colleagues, Dr. Tim Nylands and uh, Dr. Sean Mohan, using a Visigo sheet from the neck to ablate um, a free wall accessory pathway. Um, those sheets can be very cumbersome when used from the neck due to their length. And Dr. Jackman's group have suggested using an epicardial sheet to actually facilitate this, which, uh, which I can see would be very helpful. The other ablation techniques for this location are also from using a long sheet from the IVC but using it to then um, curve the catheter or hook the catheter under the valve. Dr. Um, Jackman's group, as well as um, Wong uh, T et al. have shown that using a halo catheter can be helpful in first mapping right free wall axillary pathways, and then using that as a tract to stabilize the catheter to then perform ablation. We have routinely started using uh, contact force catheters for right free wall axillary pathways. Those have been very helpful. Finally, using ice um, imaging um, to help with localization of uh, the catheter and to make sure that appropriate contact is achieved can be very helpful as well. Thank you.